Thank you so much. Uh, it is so good to be here. Um, this is the first time I have spoken at a tech conference in person in more than two years. So apologies in advance uh, if I am rusty at this. I mean, I've already, I'm just looking at these slides and I found my first error, which is that I'm actually a senior staff engineer, so I have demoted myself. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, um, my Twitter is there. Um, I've also put a URL for the slides of this talk. So. Um, you might not grab a photo of that. There is a, I'm going to talk about a bunch of um, papers and articles that other people have written, people who are smarter than I am. And there is a references slide at the end of this so that you can find the links to those amazing things that I'm going to talk about. So um, if you want to follow along, um, you should be able to find that there. So um, was anyone in the room for the last talk, uh, the one about multi-cloud? Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> so I, sh I should say first, um, whenever you guys get a Slack day off, I get the opposite. I generally get paged and uh, have, to, have to help put it all back together. So this has been my sort of background. Um, before Slack, I was at Google. And before that, I was working at an e-commerce company. And the last 10 years or more of my career have really been all about performance, reliability, robustness in distributed systems. And I know some of you are in this room are probably thinking, well, I only run a very small service, but all of our systems are distributed now. I mean, we're all, um, you know, we're, we're all dealing with web services, and most of us have one or more like data stores back in there. Maybe you've got a caching layer, maybe you've got load balancers. You know, you don't need to be running a huge uh, microservices um, ecosystem, or you know, being or running like AWS cloud infrastructure to be running a distributed system. So. This is interesting because in distributed systems, there are so many ways that things can go wrong. And I'm sure many of you, like me, on, on these Slack days have experienced that. And you know, it's, it's not great. <laughs> it's not good for your availability of your systems. It's not good for getting other work done. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we would like our systems to be more robust. Um, you know, and of course, revenue and customer trust and all of these things. So, a lot of people are thinking about what are strategies that we can use to make this all less terrible. And harking back to the, uh, probably many of you were in the keynote this morning, and you know uh, the, the keynote speaker mentioned DevOps. So something like 15 years ago, DevOps came in, and oh my god, DevOps was a revolution. Um, DevOps was, you know, I, I worked for, for, for some years in a, in, a, in a place where we did a big release every two years. It was hell, you know. DevOps and these ideas around CI, CD and making software operations better were great. And then we had SRE, and we have this big focus on metrics and SLOs and a lot of other stuff besides, but SRE came. And now there's this move, and, and people who think about software operations, a lot of people are talking about resilience engineering and picking up ideas from um, safety uh, science. And one of these ideas is a thing called graceful extensibility. This is a quote here from a very smart person who I know called David D. Woods. And um, he basically says, graceful extensibility, it's the opposite of brittleness. So if we think about systems in nature, we very often find that they're robust. They, you know, they can take an insult or an injury or, or, you know, and, and they come back from it, right? You know, maybe not, but not from everything, thinking of climate change, but natural systems, they're very robust in ways that engineered systems are not. You know, very, very, very tiny problems can make your entire um, technology stack fall over and go on fire. It's typically, they're not as robust as a, a natural system. So, so we're paying attention to this idea of, of, of system safety and where is my cursor? It's hiding somewhere. Oh, here we go. Right. Um, so we're trying to uh, think about how can we make our systems more, more like natural systems, more robust. So there's a really great talk by Dr. Richard Cook, which is in my references slide, which you'll find on the internet. Um, and he talks about, he's a doctor, as well as someone who's interested in safety science and resilience. And he talks about the resilience of bone. So his big point about bone is, sure, a bone will break, but bones heal. And you know, they have this, this sort of flux. They're laying down minerals, and they're losing minerals all the time. And they adapt after an injury. And they will get just as strong as they used to be most of the time, right? 
but they need support. Um, you know, you need to hold that bone in place. So you're doing some engineering to let the natural resilience of that system kind of come to the fore, right? So we're working, we're, we're working as engineers or doctors with systems that have some natural resilience. And his, his point about all of this is humans in the system are important. You know, humans um, we, we, can, we can take these systems that have some natural resilience and we can add to that resilience by planning and sort of understanding how the system works and thinking about how we might extend and, and, and make that better. So again, with bone, I mean, thinking about, you know, there are diseases of bone, um, osteoporosis. Uh, our doctors can tell us to lift some weights and eat some calcium, you know, and this is good for us. So again, we have doctors sort of engineering these resilient systems. So. Bringing this back to technology and distributed systems, um, there's actually resilience in kind of two different scopes, I think. There's big resilience and there's small resilience. So small resilience is dealing with like a, low, a, lot, like a short term spike in traffic, or maybe we rolled out a bug and things went crazy for a while, or you know, the network got slow, you know, these kinds of technical things, things that typically are short term, you deal with it in a few minutes or a few hours, or, you know, maybe if you're at Lassie in a few weeks. Um, but big, you know, how do we deal over periods of years and years with requirements changing and the environment changing, um, people leaving the team, different priorities. So, you know, the way I think about it is engineering, we're kind of dealing with the, the small resilience, like the resilience, like the physical structure of bone healing itself. And then with big resilience, you know, we're thinking about things like how do we set a broken bone or put pins in a broken bone? And how do we, you know, plan our diet and exercise strategies so that we don't have osteoporosis when we are 70? So we need both kinds of things, right? We really need both. So the first half of this talk, we're going to talk mostly about ways that we can make our system our, do the small resilience thing, make our systems more like bone. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the big resilience ideas. So a lot of this talk is going to be about load and overload. Um, what do we do when our systems get a spike in load for whatever reason? And how do they, how do they react to that? Because our systems have two states. And this is true of pretty much all systems, and it's even true of you know, your human systems, your teams, right? You can be saturated, um, fully loaded, working at full capacity, um, or you can be completely um, unsaturated. Um, you, know, you have some slack in the system, you can get things done more quickly, you don't have latency things hanging around for a long time. So one of the interesting things about the saturated state is you get into a saturate, saturated state, you typically, you get slower, and um, because of that, because your system is sort of juggling a queue of work as well as doing work, you'll very often see that um, actually the throughput of your system drops. Your system is doing less work. And does anyone ever here done load testing of their systems? Yeah, a few of you. Yeah, you might see there's very often a curve. You know, you, you apply more load, your system does more work, and then you get to a point and you plateau, and that's kind of your maximum throughput of your system. And then it then it's often drops. If you start throwing more load, it'll drop. Um, and sometimes at that point, your system will even sort of get hung up. You know, you'll start, you, you'll start, um, you'll end up with resources locked up. Um, you won't be able to accept more connections, that kind of thing. And sometimes you will need to go and restart your, 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 your systems, right? That's not resilient. Ideally, your system wouldn't go past that good put point. Ideally, you'd get to that good put point and start shedding load. That's, it's more robust. It makes your system more like bone, less like brittle concrete or glass or something, right? And overload is, is really something that's worth thinking about because in a distributed system, you don't just get overload in one place. You tend to get overload in one place causing slowness, which tends to have knock-on effects in other places, and you start getting exhaustion of threads or other resources, and your slowness spreads, and clients will start retrying, and the whole thing can become kind of a big self-sustaining mess. And added to that, is the difficulty of figuring out how this has started and how to, how to stop it, right? Um, because when, you, when, when your overload spreads, um, because everything is now slow and overloaded, it's hard to know what, what, what actually caused it, what triggered it, and how to stop it. 
So we'd like to avoid getting into these situations. They're very, very messy, very stressful, very bad for our availability. We know we don't want it. So a lot of the a lot of the work in you know that my team does is about making sure that we don't get into those kinds of situations. So a few of the you know, we will talk about some examples now. So here is an unloaded container ship. This is not a Docker talk, don't worry, even though it's a container ship. Um, you know, in, in our systems, actually, we spend most of our time working with them and thinking about them and using them when they're in this unloaded state. We do. I mean, most of the time you're working with your system, it's under pretty light load, or at least moderate load that it can deal with. So this is, this is how we're used to seeing and thinking and working with our systems, right? You know, but unfortunately, sometimes our systems are fully loaded and anything to get a reference to the ever given talk. Does anyone follow Jorts the cat on the internet? When the other one got stuck up in, up in Chicago, was it? Uh, you know, the, the best tweet ever. Um, we need a little boat stuck as a treat. Yeah, that's a great story. Anyway, but systems in our fully loaded state, they behave differently. They really do. And that's why it's important to think about that upfront, design for it, and plan for it using these amazing patterns. Um, so retries are a big thing that can trigger these kinds of overload meltdowns. Um, and the problem is when we think about retries, we're thinking about what retries are doing in the unsaturated state that we normally work in, right? So in an unsaturated state, you might get a failed request because something transiently goes wrong. You know, maybe a host is slow, maybe it's doing a garbage collection, maybe we had a little network blip or a host just went away and got replaced. In that case, a retry is good because there's a user or, well, maybe, maybe a robot. Something is on the other end of that request and wants that request to happen. If I retry, chances are it's going to work and I'll have a happy user. Retries are good in an unsaturated state. Retries are bad in a saturated state because they make the saturation worse. The problem is you, as a client, you don't have a global view of the system. You don't actually know, are you in a saturated state or are you not in a saturated state? You can only make decisions with the information that you actually have. And so too often people, um, you know, people very, very rightly put retries in their system and you end up in this, this feedback cycle where server overload causes failed requests causes client retries, which increases the server overload, and we go on fire. It's bad. So the first pattern that we're going to look at, and this is really amazingly simple. I'm, probably a lot of people have seen this one. Hands up if you've seen the circuit breaker pattern. OK, good, about half the room. So not, not new to many of you, but new to some of you. Um, I think nearly all, without exception, distributed systems, um, client to server relationships should use the circuit breaker pattern because it's just more robust in almost all cases and it has very few downsides. So this is why I, I put it in here because I think everyone should know about it and we should always use it. You know, it's not, it, this is not something that you should see in a talk and read it or read in a book and then go on with your life like it doesn't apply to you. It applies to you, to all of you, Circuit Breaker. Um, so, um, by the way, uh, I think Circuit Breaker, I think, originates with Martin Fowler or, or, Mike, or Michael T. Nygaard, one of those. They both wrote about it in roughly about the same time frame in the early 2010s. But here's how it looks. So you've got a client, you've got a server. Your client is making some requests of your server. Your server is sending back responses. If all the responses are good, 200s of some sort, or you know, a nice status. Your circuit breaker is open. Everything is great. If you start getting bad responses or timeouts or something bad is happening as a client, you can see this sequence, and you can flip your circuit breaker from open to closed. In the closed state, the client does not send any requests to the server, so you don't retry you've flipped into a different state. Um, then you, you do a curling off period, you wait for a while. And this allows, hopefully allows, the server system to get a break, to deal with its hangover of load, 
to start coming back into a healthy state and serving again. So the idea here is to basically smooth over a big transient spike of traffic and let things go back to normal before letting the traffic flow again. It's simple and powerful, but it, and it does work. Um, so how do you implement a circuit breaker? There's different ways. You can build this into your client code. Most of the big popular programming languages have a circuit breaker library now that you can just use. Um, if you use a proxy, I'm going to talk about Envoy proxy again in the next uh, section, but this is not an Envoy talk, but Envoy proxy has got um, some, some, some configurable options for doing circuit breaking if you're using um, Envoy to manage traffic between parts of your system. Um, I will caution here that what they call circuit breaking isn't quite what I'm describing here or what the traditional pattern would be, but there's a thing called adaptive currency control concurrency control, which is this. So it can, it, this is really easy to do, and I, I don't think there's any reason to not do this. Um, no matter how small your system is, um, surprises happen. And I've looked at a lot of different examples of um, cascading failures happening in systems large and small. Even if your system is purely internal, um, you can have a, a client go rogue and start um, you know, hitting your system with crazy retry loops. So. So I think um, having this system and having it at a proxy level is the most powerful thing, because then you don't need to control all your clients. So here's how we get our circuit breaker back open again. You send a request, see if it works, and if, it, if it's good, you open again. So this is my second passion that I wanted to talk about, panic routing which I suspect is um, a lot less commonly known about than the circuit breaker pattern. Anyone here used panic writing? Come across it? Uh, OK, excellent. So <laughs> I don't want to be up here telling you about things that you already know. There's no point in that. So panic writing. So the problem we're trying to solve here is still the exact same thing. Our systems are getting overloaded. Everything is terrible. So. In this situation, we have a load balancer and we have some, some upstreams. So this is typically what happens. Your load balancer is going to health check your servers to see if they're up and able to serve. Um, and if they're not able to serve, if they're, if they're sad in their status here, we don't send requests to them. So what happens here? Um, in this case, we have a lot of unhealthy servers and why it could be for a lot of reasons. Maybe they're overloaded. Maybe there's a network issue. Maybe, maybe somebody pushed a bad piece of code to the health check endpoint. I have seen that happen. But your servers are reporting unhealthy for some reason. What do we do now? We laser all the load on our subset of healthy backends. Is that good? It is not good because now this goes on fire and we have no healthy backends and we are hard down. We did this to ourselves. Why did we do that? <laughs> we don't want to do that. So this is where panic writing comes in. So if we, if we, have panic, if we don't have panic writing, uh, or we have panic writing in this situation, um, what panic writing basically does is it says, if X percent of my upstreams, my servers, are reporting unhealthy, I will just send load evenly across all of them. I'm, I'm going to ignore a health check at that point. But it has a mode. It can be on or off. So here, we're, if we have a 50% threshold for unhealthy backends, we only have 25% unhealthy, so panic routing is turned off. So we don't write requests to our unhealthy uh, backend. We, we write requests to all the rest of them. Now, now we're back in this situation again. We have 75% of our backends are unhealthy. Panic routing has flipped on. So now we, 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 send, we send requests evenly across all of them. And this is not going to be perfect, right? We are having an outage or an incident of some sort, and all we can do is do our best. But in this case, we've seen that a couple of our um, unhealthy nodes are still able to do some work. Some of them aren't. Um, so we're not, we're not able to get everything perfect, but we are able to serve some load. We are no longer hard down, and this is, this is better. 
This is more robust because you know, it's much better to be a bit degraded than it is to be hard down for hours. So that's panic writing. The third pattern I want to talk about, and this is, um, I'm going to do that thing where people who worked at Google say, well, when we were at Google. Um, but this is something that I haven't seen outside of Google so much, but is something that some of the really popular frameworks inside of Google did. So here's what it is. Um, a lot of your web frameworks, um, either implicitly or implicitly, or implicitly or explicitly, create a queue of work. Requests come in, and you have a queue, and workers are doing work in some order. Like I say, it might not be an explicit queue data structure. It might just be sort of processes waiting. But typically, there's some sort of queuing behavior here. Now, this is normally what happens. Uh, a request comes in, and the oldest requests get serviced first, um, as in, Things go in, and the, the first requests that were put in the queue will eventually get serviced, and newer requests wait. Now, one very important thing to make your systems robust, and I didn't make this its own specific pattern, but when you have a work queue like this, your queue should be a bounded size. Do not let this just grow indefinitely. First off, you know, your computer only has so much memory. And then second off, there's just no point queuing up work that your system is never going to do, right? Also, work typically, unless you're, unless you're explicitly dealing with an asynchronous system, and I'm, I'm talking about synchronous systems here, if, unless you are doing asynchronous work explicitly, most of the time, your clients only care about that request for a relatively short period of time. So it's a good pad practice for clients to set a timeout on requests, and for servers as well. And if a request queues or takes too long, cancel it, or just ignore the result. The ways of doing this differ depending on what kind of RPC framework that you're using. Some, some frameworks make this explicit, some do not. However, um, the anti-pattern here is if your system is overloaded or gets slow for whatever reason, maybe you know, somebody kicks off a heavy cron job on the same host, or you have a noisy neighbor, or a slow network, or one of your dependencies is slow, you can end up having your workers only doing work for requests that have been sitting there for a very long time. Requests that the client may already not care about. This is very bad, because if you're working only on requests that your clients don't care about, you're not doing any useful work. Your system is, is, is not down, but it might as well be down. And this can cause really, really super nasty outages. So about three or four years ago, I gave a talk called Black Swans um, at a few conferences, including SRECon. And uh, one, of the, one of the incidents that I look at in that talk was a really nasty AWS incident where one of their control planes had this exact problem. Um, it got a little bit slow, and it was already pretty close to, to its, its limits, work capacity-wise. and all these requests just started timing out. So what can we do about this? And by the way, this is a really nasty problem to solve because, like I said before, you want timeouts on your requests because if you don't have deadlines or timeouts, if things stop, get, if, if things hang up or get slow, you can just end up in a situation where everything just jams up and everything is just waiting for everything else. So you need timeouts, but timeouts have this problem. What to do? We do this. <laughs> We use a stack instead of a queue, and that means that you're always working on the most recent requests. Now, this is not fair, but your computer doesn't care. Computers don't care about fairness. That's a human idea. So we do this. And actually, it, it works surprisingly well. Because in, in, in a system that's not heavily loaded, you're, always, you're, you're going to frequently get to the bottom of your stack. And in a system that is overloaded, you're guaranteed to be doing work that is useful on requests that are still current. So counterintuitive, but really useful. So I'm going to briefly talk about these last two patterns. So I think these first three patterns that I talked about are really relevant to most of us, um, even if your system is not super complicated. But there are a couple of um, kind of architectural patterns that are less easy to drop in to an existing system, but that are still worth knowing about. So cellular systems is the first of these. 
So this is a system where instead of having one huge multi-tenant system, where if one, one piece of your system starts going bananas for whatever reason, the whole thing will go down. So you know, think about if you're running like a big multi-tenant service that's dealing with some sort of queries. Who here knows what a query of death is? Ah, OK. A query of death is a query that can crash your workers. A queries of death are very bad because, let's say, one of your clients um, makes a change that causes them to send queries of death to your system, whether intentionally or not. Um, what they'll do is they'll send the query, and they'll crash your first worker, and then they'll retry it and crash the next one, and so on and so forth, until you don't have any, um, any of your service running left anymore. So um, sometimes users can also just send queries that are very heavy or send a lot of them. So a lot of, a lot of load systems, load problems on multi-tenant systems are kind of very hot spotty. They may be related to particular users or sets of users. And the, but the problem is when one user goes berserk and starts doing things that are very difficult on your backend systems, that can take down everyone else's stuff. That's bad. So you can use a thing called a cellular design. So basically, your data and your work are sort of organized in vertical, little vertical cells, which are dedicated to a particular set of users. Each user is mapped to only one cell. And then what you have to do in this situation is you have to be able to split and merge cells based on load. So if a cell, if, if a user, say, Say a user may be an organization and you know, they do an acquisition and they acquire a whole bunch more um, members of their team, you might need to split the cell that they're, they were mapped into. But the idea here is isolate your failures. It's also very good if you want to roll out changes um, in, 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 a, in a graceful way. So if I want to test something new, I can roll it out to my dog food cells that my own organization uses or to a set of canary cells, and I can monitor those separately. So it's a very good, safe way of doing rollouts. Uh, again, there's, I, in the references slide, I put a link into a paper called uh, Millions of Tiny Databases, which is really brilliant. It's by Mark Brooker and some other researchers from AWS, well, engineers from AWS, and it was at NSDI a couple of years back. It's a good read. So this is the last pattern. So this is called constant work. And again, like cellular architectures, this is something that you don't just drop in. This is something that has to be designed from the ground up. Um, it's also uh, based on cellular architectures. So if you have a system that um, fits certain types of parameters, you can do this. Constant work systems, they don't scale under load. They're always the same size, always the same number of uh, workers and processes running. And they don't have modes. So they don't have things like panic routing or circuit breaking. <coughs> they just work the same way all the time, whether they're loaded or not. If they do have any sort of a mode, they'll do less work under stress. So who here got coffee this morning? Yeah, did, did it take some time? Yeah, it did. Uh, <laughs> that system is not a constant work system. <laughs> so um, I've actually stolen this example from Colin McCarthy, my fellow Irish person. Um, and I've linked his article in my references slide. But um, coffee is the example he uses, right? You know, the, the, every, the, it was very good coffee, but making an espresso for each, or a cafe con leche for each person does not scale. Think about a coffee urn instead. Your coffee urn, you make one coffee urn um, for every 10 minutes, and you're doing the same work. You know? um, and if your coffee is still full, all you have to do is keep heating that same coffee, and it's good for a while. Constant work. And this is how it's normally done at conferences in not Spain. Um, <laughs> um, but it's an example of a, const a simple example of a constant work system. So, you have to design systems to do exactly the same thing every time. So this works well with periodic work. Like, say I need to health check a bunch of things and report the status. So I build, a, build cells. Um, each worker is responsible for health checking a particular set of, set of um, backends in a cell. You split the cell if it grows too much. And here's another really clever thing. Instead of sending, say, a list of, here are my health checks that were down, you send a table. And it's the same size of table every time. So backend one is up, backend two is down, backend one, three is up, and so on. So 
that means that if you I mean, it's more inefficient under under regular situations because you can't just say, okay, well, assume everything that was previously up is still up. But it means that if you have an incident, you don't suddenly find that, oh man, okay, now I need to re report that all these things are down and I'm sending a much bigger response than usual. And now I don't have network bandwidth and everything is broken. So it's predictability. You're optimizing for predictability. Um, also, one of the other key, key ideas here is in a constant work system, you should push results out to consumers instead of having your consumers polling you because your system wants to do this constant work and part of the work is responding to, or part of the work is, is pushing your results out. You can control that and predict it if you do the push. You cannot control and predict pull. So that's just an idea. Um, like I say, you're only going to be able to use this in certain situations, and this is really a more I'm building critical infrastructure kind of an idea. But if you do need to build some, some piece of infrastructure from the ground up and it fits this kind of model of a periodic thing, it's worth thinking about. So what I've tried to do here is sort of give you like a, an overview of a bunch of different kind of ways of dealing with the overload state. Um, because they really all are, right? And the, the circuit breaker, it detects overload and trips and cuts the load. Panic routing, it just recounts the routes requests evenly to avoid overload. The, the LIFO idea, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize useful work when you're overloaded. Cellular systems are trying to reduce the blast radius of overload. And constant work is trying to design the possibility of overload out of the system entirely. So a bunch of different ideas there if you want to build a system that is robust like bone. Now, what about our teams? So particularly in this kind of time of the, the great resignation, um, it's really important to invest in people and teams. And what this means is when you're dealing with complex systems, and we all are, Try and avoid siloing. It's more efficient to say, okay, well, Laura is the person who knows about consoles, so she should do a lot of the console work because we're all very busy. But that means that I'm the person who knows about console forever, and that's bad for my team, bad for my organization. You gotta intentionally share knowledge. Um, a lot of this tends to be done around incidents or production stuff, but it can also be around your, your, your kind of, your more, um, your more, your more everyday processes. So for example, I make sure that we don't end up with a person who is the only person who releases our Envoy service mesh when we have a new change there. We must share this work and all be responsible for it. Training. Um, I think we should all be investing in training more than we probably do. Um, it's, it's hard to make the time, but training is useful. Um, when I write training, I try and make it hands-on or a mixture of hands-on in theory. So I might link people to some information about the architecture of a system. And then I will write a little exercise where they get to go and look at the, you know, you know, jump onto a server in dev, curl the metrics, look, see this, see that, here are the logs. Actually sort of showing your way around the system in a hands-on way, I think is quite powerful when we're trying to train new engineers. I also really believe in exposing the state of a system. Logs are okay. Dashboards are great, um, but I think being able to jump onto a box and have it show me a status page that tells me what it thinks, what state it thinks the world has can be a really powerful way of figuring what, what's going on in the system. Our brains are pretty bad at trying to think about a whole distributed system in an integrated way, so sometimes jumping on a, a few sets of hosts and seeing what's this host seeing in terms of latency or PC latency um, what's it seeing in terms of load? You know, what does it think is the status of the overall system? It can be very, very powerful. Um, then the other thing is, you know, when I'm talking about this kind of robustness work, I'll be finished in one moment. Um, we have to prioritize that against other things that we do. Um, you know, particularly if we're thinking about things that are the big lifts, like move our system to cellular architecture. Um, Gauging risk is really hard because we're trying to, you know, we're trying to figure out what future what futures may happen, and we don't always have the informational basis to do so. That's just the reality. 
um, we have to think about trade-offs. Um, is it worse if we don't re if we don't release this fe feature, or if we have a small percentage? We don't know what the percentage chance is of an outage next month. SLOs are good when you have slow burn issues, so small things that happen predictably, but they they won't tell you about the risk of a big cascading failure type outage. Human judgment tends to be better because people know, they know where the bodies are buried, they know where the problems are. So listen to your people is my advice. Um, don't just look at graphs. Um, this is, uh, I probably don't have time to talk about this, this is uh, linked in uh, my references slide. This is Rasmussen's model of drifting into failure. We always have pressure to produce and to be cheaper. But um, we also have, that has a tendency to push us more towards um, having our systems be a little bit more brittle and more prone to, to failure. So we don't know where we are at any given point. Are we close to the error margin on the left where we're gonna have start having problems? Um, you only know when you get there, that's the fact. So you have to watch for the signs that you're having near misses. Um, so just finish with this, you know. Recognizing hazard, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's um, successfully manipulating system operations to remain inside the tolerable performance boundaries requires intimate contact with failure. We're all gonna see failure, that's okay. It's what we take away and what we learn from it. This is from a great paper called How Complex Systems Fail, which once more I've linked from my references slide. So just to say thank you, um, again, the talk is linked there from that tiny URL link. Um, if you have any questions that don't get addressed here, I'm happy to talk about it on Twitter um, or email. Um, I work at Slack. Um, we're not hiring much in EMEA at the moment, but we do sometimes have roles. Um, again, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thank you. Your questions now. We have eight minutes. Just raise your hand, no, don't be shy. Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, can you tell us an uh, example that's happening during your career that you have seen uh, one of those failures and how you, have you solved it, one of the pattern, and maybe with something different? I, ha I have seen um, overload and cascading failures so many times. Um, now, of course, that's symptomatic of working at uh, companies that have a certain scale and uh, maybe companies that are emerging from a hyper growth phase. But yeah, I've definitely seen these kinds of failures. In fact, if you would like to see a story of this kind of failure, um, if, look at the Slack engineering blog. Um, two days ago, I posted a post about the big incident that we had on February 22nd, which did ab absolutely, it had a, one of these kind of cascading failure elements in it. Unfortunately, not one that we could have solved with any of the easy fixes, I don't think, but um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, all the time. And which pattern did this work for, for that issue? <laughs> which pattern worked for that one? You should go read the blog post. Um, there was uh, some other things at play there. But I mean, yeah, I mean, this is absolutely a real thing. Um, we had a very big incident um, a couple of years back now um, that involved um, we had problems with our console service discovery system, and we have a, a system that sits in front of that and acts as a cache for it. And the problem wasn't that console was down per se, the problem was that we had um, a lot of health check failures flapping because we had a problem with our network. So the network caused the health things to flap. That caused the service catalog to fluctuate all the time, and our clients were then constantly pulling down new host lists so what, what that caused a cascading failure meltdown. And um, then clients um, kept trying to basically reconnect to our, um, the cache layer that we have in front of our service discovery system. And that went down and had to come back up. Um, because it was coming up from cold, every time a new instance was coming up, it was just getting slammed with load. So what we ended up doing was putting rate limiting on that to um, slowly accept new connections. So yeah, that's uh, no, one of the more recent examples. Um, again, the, it, it, this is absolutely real. It will, it will happen, well, if you, if you work with distributed systems for long enough, even at quite small scales, it can happen. You know, if I've, heard, I've heard stories about this happening even at you know, relatively, relatively small and uncomplicated systems. Um, it can be as simple as you know, 
somebody changed a client configuration to retry 500 times in a tight loop. You know, that can be enough to cause this kind of cascading overload thing. So. Thank you. We have another question. Nice. Thanks for the, um, for the talk. Uh, I have a curiosity. Uh, when you talk about the uh, isolated uh, no, um, the, the cells, mm -hmm. you talk about the dog food and canary cells. Mm -hmm. Are they the same? What, 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 what are they? Oh, it depends on, oh, that depends on you. Um, so in a cellular, cellular kind of architecture like that, dog food obviously is when you're, you know, eating your own dog food using your own system. Some companies um, will deploy changes, um, unreleased changes to dog food first, um, so that they will see first themselves if something has degraded or broken. So um, if you, and there's no sort of standard library or template or framework for building a cellular system. These things are always a little bit bespoke. So if you wanted to um, assign your own organization to a particular cell, call it dog food and roll changes out there first. That's what that would be. Um, canarying is a little bit different. I didn't explain it, but what a canary is, it's, it's a way of doing releases. So if you have, say, N backends, 10, 10 servers that you run your service on, um, you can canary by every time you release new code or change configuration, you do that on your canary one first and you monitor key metrics such as error rate, latency, anything else that your system, anything else you think is important. You know, do you have freshness or any of these kinds of other concepts? So you monitor that stuff. And if you see that it's significantly worse on the canary, you'd normally wait a little while and sort of make sure that things settle then you know that something has caused a regression in your canary and you could roll it back and yeah. investigate. And you so, test it internally or you, you serve it to the public like in production? Dog food company. is usually internal. Canary, canary. Is, usually, is usually user real user traffic. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you talk about SL or sorry, uh, I don't know. Ah, yes, sorry. I didn't explain SLOs either, sorry. <laughs> um, Service level objectives. Um, this has become a sort of a big fashion in, 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 in software operations in the last maybe five years, um, possibly a bit longer. So a SLO is a service level objective. So this is when you say, I want my, want, I want my service to always um, be 99.99% available. And I want latencies to be under 100 milliseconds um, at the 90th percentile. So you're defining kind of performance standards for your service. And the idea is you monitor them. And every, maybe every week, you look at your last week and did you meet your SLOs? And if you didn't, you go investigate and figure out what happened and why. And, and then one last thing says, um it's nice that uh, some of these are uh, applicable also to teams, as you say, with the yeah. silos and stuff. The problem is that uh, some, uh, often uh, we, we run also always in emergency mode. There is always no time to educate someone else or to, to train, not educate, to train uh, maybe someone else. And uh, at the end, it, it happens, the silos happening. But it's yeah. a, a sort of mind, uh, you know. Uh, it's a real thing. That's because we're running our teams in an overload state too much of the time. If, if you don't have time to do training and, and share knowledge, you are running overloaded and eventually there may be problems. Yeah. Thank you. And one more question and we'll be yeah. last one. Okay. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. And uh, this may be not a question, but rather another idea. Oh, maybe I will. Yeah. It's maybe not a, a question, but an idea of uh, another approach to, to overload. Uh, what do you think about uh, trying to maybe degrade the feed, the, uh, degra or rather... Um, Great graceful, yeah. graceful degradation. Uh, yeah, graceful yeah. degradation of the feature of the algorithm which is used to handle the, the problematic request. For example, in a search system, uh, in a text search system like Google, we could turn off, uh, for example, spell checking of user query, use some um, uh, not, not, that, not, that, um, not that relevant uh, ranking method, but which would be easier to, to process compute yep. uh, in case of an, of an, over, of, of an overload. Yeah, um, so this is absolutely another um, 
I, I, I only had 30 minutes. Um, graceful degradation is definitely another approach that you can take. Um, not all systems have an obvious way to do less work um, in, in an overload situation, but for those that do, it is not a bad thing to do. Sometimes it's almost a natural consequence, right? So for example, if you're working with, I used to work with e-commerce systems, and a lot of the work there is in personalization of a land, of a product page or a landing page. So in, in, a, in a situation of overload, you can just turn that personalization off, right? So that's, um, and, and this can always happen naturally. So if your personalization service doesn't respond to you <laughs> and it's overloaded, you, just, you, can, you can just basically fail over to, uh, to a non-personalized page. So yeah, I mean, at the, graceful degradation is one of those things that's less universally applicable because it's a bit more service specific. Yes, so. and it requires uh, an algorithm which has some parts which can be turned off or replaced yeah. with some other which are uh, faster, more efficient, but return less optimal results. Yep. If you can do it, that's absolutely valid. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.